So I'm sure it won't have escaped your notice that the price of everything is skyrocketing at the moment, but one of life's pleasures has remained remarkably affordable. And as a bonus, it's easy to work on, parts are cheap, it's easy to own, and crucially, it's a hoot to drive. The MG Midget. Our friends at Lancaster Insurance are running monthly giveaways. You can win all sorts, from experience days to tools, restaurant vouchers, and tech. So click the link below at the end of the video to enter their latest competition. Now, of course, the MG Midget has always been about being an affordable sports car. It was launched in 1961 as a badge engineered version of the Austin Healey Sprite Mark II, which itself was a revision of the famous Frog Eye Sprite launched in 1958, which was built at the Abingdon factory anyway, so it was a natural progression. Originally, it started life as a 948cc car, so it was MG's first sub one litre car since 1936. But that didn't last very long. Within a year, it had been fitted with a 1098cc engine and disc brakes. And for the launch of the Mark II version in 1964, it got a stronger crankshaft, exterior door handles and wind up windows and some interior revisions to make it a little bit more practical to use. Now the Mark III version came out in 1966 and that's the one that a lot of people like. Chrome bumpers, 1275cc engine and it came at last with a folding hood rather than the packaway unit, making it much more practical proposition for daily use. Things didn't really change too much after that when BL took over. That was until 1970 when you got a matte black grille, matte black sills, little quarter bumpers on the rear rather than the full length bumper. Of all the Mark III's, it's the version with round wheel arches launched in 1972 that seemed to be the most desirable of all. Come 1974, major changes were needed to suit the US market. So the arches were squared off again, making it a little bit stronger at the rear end. The main change was the big rubber Bayflex bumpers front and rear and a raised ride height to bring those bumpers to the correct height to meet the legislation. And of course the massive change was under the bonnet. Out went the A-Series, in came a 1500 unit from the Triumph Spitfire, historically the midget's rival. That's the way it basically continued until 1979, just a year ahead of Abingdon closing its doors with the last 500 cars made in black. So that's the history covered. Here's what you need to know if you're looking to buy one. Now the most important thing when you're looking at a midget is undoubtedly the bodywork. The simple monocoque body has lots of nooks and crannies that trap moisture and lead to corrosion. First thing is the bonnet. Now the way it opens puts a lot of flex at the front of the bonnet, can lead to corrosion, and there's reinforcement panels under there that can trap moisture as well. Check the front valance and the front panel under the bumper for corrosion. Also check the wings around the headlight bulb. There's an important point to note here that the indicator units actually move down the wing from around 1968 on. So check the car doesn't have odd wings if it's had a replacement. Being an open top, a lot of the strength is in the gearbox tunnel and the inner and outer sills. You really need to pay attention to the condition here. So sort of feel along, check for corrosion, look inside the back of the arches here, both ends, front and rear, can extend into the sill, even into the floor pans. There's a little bung here that would allow you to have a quick look at the condition of the inner sill, give you some indication. But basically, if there's a problem, the door may snag or nip on the sill, and that's not good. While you're at it, just have a good look around the seams, the door gaps, just check everything's right. Also check the door for corrosion in the bottom. The A-post is quite a stressed part, so just check there's no play. Have a good feel around here as well. Checking the scuttle panel just to check for any rot. Check the rear wings. They can rust equally whether they're round wheel arch version or the square wheel arch. Just check there's no filler in there. Have a good feel up the back here where the wing joins the boot floor. Again, another favorite corrosion spot. Now if you can get underneath, just check where the uh, rear leaf springs bolt to the shell. On the earlier cars, they had quarter elliptical springs replaced for the Mark II with half elliptical springs, but on the earlier cars, the spring mounting is a lot more stressed. Check the spring box mountings as well, and basically have a good look to check that the car's sitting even, because it could indicate a lot of corrosion. Now inside the boot, this one's full of stuff, but uh, just check the spare wheel well. Checking the boot for corrosion, having a good feel at the back, seeing if there's any corrosion leading onto the rear panel here. There's pretty much nothing for a midget you can't buy. You can buy an entire shell from British Motor Heritage, but do bear in mind that they're the thick end of 12,000 pounds and you'll have to paint it as well. So bear in mind whether your budget will take that because you can buy a pretty good example for that money. Now up until around mid 1974, the Midget had the trusty A-Series engine fitted, as used in cars like the Marina and the Morris Minor. Started off as a 948cc unit, then was upgraded to a 1098 and then a 1275. 
Generally, it's a reliable engine, good for around 75 to 100,000 miles without a rebuild. But by that point, the bottom end clearances will be getting a bit baggy and you'll probably hear some noise from the valve train. If you do hear any top end tapping, that's normally tap it's easy to adjust, but any rumbling from the bottom end could indicate a rebuild. Also check the oil pressure. You want about 65 PSI when starting up, nice and quick, and around 45 PSI when on the move. Anything less than that, again, points to a rebuild, as does engine smoke. If you get any blue on acceleration, it's probably the piston rings or the bores. A little bit of black is nothing to worry about, probably going to be timing or mixture. And if there's any blue smoke on the overrun worn valve guides or valve stem seals. Now it's worth bearing in mind that if it does need an engine rebuild, the cost of components and labor has gone up considerably recently. Gone are the days where you could go to a, a scrapyard and pick up a, a Marina 1275 unit and just slot that in. We've got the 1500 unit from 74 on. They have very small crank journals, which means that big end wear and mains wear is common. The crank thrust washers are also an issue. So just put the clutch down, check for a change in engine pitch or the, uh, the pulley moving forward to indicate where because if they're on the way out, big bills are likely to follow. The 1500 has a smaller intake so it can run a little bit hotter. Perhaps an oil cooler or an upgraded radiator are worth doing. With the A-Series, just check there's no sediment in the radiator. Anything like that can clog it up and lead to head gasket failure. The early cars had a smooth case gearbox with cone type synchromesh. Wasn't in the car for very long. Quite hard to find bits for now so it'll probably be an expensive rebuild. Later on, it was substituted for a ribbed case, bulk ring type synchromesh, much stronger, much easier to find bits for. Any A-Series midget did not have synchromesh on first gear. First and reverse are straight cut, so they will be noisy, even in perfect condition, but if they're excessively noisy, just be wary of that. The Triumph gearbox on the 1500 did have synchromesh on first gear, generally pretty strong, can be a bit of clutch judder, even in perfect condition, but again, things can be easily rebuilt, parts are readily available. So moving on to suspension, very simple design at the front, but it does need regular maintenance to avoid premature wear. There are three or four grease points, depending on the age of the vehicle. If you neglect greasing up the suspension with the correct grease or heavy oil, you'll end up with wear in the uprights and the fulcrum pins. Now the way to check this is to jack the car up, shake the wheel, top and bottom, side to side. At the same time, you'll be looking for wear in the track rod ends. The steering itself doesn't really give too many problems, but like I say, check those track rod ends and the steering gaiters for any splits or anything like that. If the car's particularly hoppy at the back end, it could be that the leaf springs have seized together. And again, look for uneven ride height just to indicate any problems. In terms of brakes, the early cars had drums all round. Just check for any wheel cylinder leaks and that the brakes pull up nice and square. The later cars are soon as 62 with discs. Normal thing, check for scores and any marks on the discs. But basically, it's a fairly troubles-free system. If you find that you'll need to pump the pedal quite a lot, it could be that the master cylinder is at fault. So moving on to the interior, probably the first thing you should check, even before looking at the rest of it, is that you can fit inside. I'm not a tall man and it's cosy in here. So for anyone who's uh, packing a bit of height, just make sure you can squeeze in. Trim is readily available, replacement trim. There were so many detail changes over the years that you might not be able to get exactly what was fitted to the car. Autumn leaf, unless you buy a complete set, you might struggle to find various bits. Early steering wheels, a lot of them have been replaced, like in this car with a mountainy unit. They're quite hard to find, but generally, you can get everything. You will be able to buy some kind of replacement trim of some kind, even if it's not spot on original. Now the electrics can cause problems, as with any classic of this age. A lot of the issues can be traced to earth points or bullet connectors under the dash, and complete wiring looms are available, so it's not a deal killer. There's a folding hood on Mark III cars from 1966 on. This is a Mark II car, but it's been reshelled with a heritage body, so it's got the later hood. Just check it's in good condition, no tears, the usual deal with a open top car. Earlier cars have pack away hoods and side screens, so a little bit more simple. So you want a midget, do you? Well, of course you do, because they're an absolute bargain at the moment. Whereas other classics like classic Fords have just skyrocketed off in price, the midget has remained fairly static in recent years. Now, you can broadly separate them into chrome bumper cars and rubber bumper cars. With chrome bumper cars, the most desirable are the early Mark 1s and the round wheel arch 1275 cars. You can expect to add about a 10% premium for these, but generally speaking, the chrome bumper cars start around 6,000 for a fairly tidy example, rising to 11,000, 12,000 for a really nicely restored one. A good Mark I could be as much as 15,000 or beyond. Now, when it comes to the 1500, these really are the bargain of the century. We've seen several at auction with MOTs recently for two to 3,000 pounds, 
ready to go. And you'd be struggling to pay much more than 6,000 for a really, really nice one. So nowadays, the MG Midget fulfills the purpose it always has, a fun, affordable sports car. It stood the test of time. There's great club support. There's great parts support. People love these. Abingdon should be rightly proud of what it achieved. Go and buy one. This video is proudly sponsored by Lancaster Insurance. Give them a call on 01480 400 889 for an insurance quote on your classic car. And don't forget to click the link below to enter their latest competition.